à l'édification de la société. C'est un moment qui nous interpelle à poser un regard rétrospectif pour commémorer également les réalisations de ceux et celles qui nous ont précédés et nous souvenir qu'elles qu ont été confrontées à l'injustice, à l'antiracisme noir, non seulement ici au Canada, mais à travers le monde entier. Ils, elles, ont pavé la voie pour nous, pour notre présent. Nous bénéficions de leur lutte, leur résistance, leur résili résilience, leurs victoires qui ont conduit à des multiples réalisations dans l'histoire de l'humanité. De ce retour vers le passé, nous tirons des leçons pour vivre et construire notre présent qui est encore fait d'injustice et de discrimination antiraciste anti noire dans le monde. Nous l'avons récemment vécu avec le décès de ce jeune homme aux États-Unis il voulait juste rentrer chez lui, comme tout être humain. C'est dire l'antiracisme noir est structurel mondialement. Il n'est pas encore vaincu. Il faut encore de la résistance, de l'activisme pour continuer la quête de la justice sociale. À l'Institut Ariel Thorman et au SEREC, et au CEREC nous avons choisi de reconnaître les mérites d'une des nôtres, une ancienne étudiante de Glendon, Madame Saglier, qui s'est distinguée par son engagement comme écrivaine, consultante et activiste pour la cause des Noirs. If we can celebrate Black History Month today, it is because of your activism, Madame Saglier. We salute you for that. And as a Glendon community, as a Glendon family, we are honored to have you. You have made us at Glendon feeling very proud of you and your accomplishment. I think I'm not going to talk too much about you. You are the best person to share with us all you have accomplished. So the floor is yours. I'm I'm waiting for a microphone. Microphones were made for me. Nobody can ever hear me. And um, in February, for sure, nobody's going to hear me. Um, but I, I will let you know that what I, what I was asked to do um, was to speak for a few minutes about me, which is really not my area of comfort. So I wrote a few things down. And I will be sharing that with you when we have the mic to make sure that you hear them. And I'm not. Um, looking at people that are completely puzzled about what it is I'm trying to say. And I appreciate that the land acknowledgement was offered. I think that that's uh, critically important. You don't have a mic? We're waiting for batteries. You're still waiting up. Oh, goodness. OK. So what year are you in? First year. Second year. Oh, somebody is in fourth year? Was, your hand was just up because you're here? <laughs> no, the person beside you, you just had your hand up. So you're in what year? What year? But the person behind you. Oh, second. Second, okay. Those were good times. <laughs> <laughs> it gets better, third year is the best. Well, maybe I'll begin anyway. 
and then you'll hear me better when the mic comes. So uh, hello out there, virtual people. Thank you for <laughs> joining. Um, the land acknowledgement was offered, but that covers First Nations. And I do a land acknowledgement or an African acknowledgement because I also think that's important. It's short. So I would like to acknowledge this land was settled and supported very early by people of African origin, the first named African being translator Matthew da Costa by 1604, and of the ongoing and seminal contribution made by him and those that preceded and followed in Canada's development. Je reconnais les nombreuses personnes descendantes africaines qui ne sont pas des colonnes, mais sont donc des ancestres, ont été déplacés de force dans le cadre de la traite transatlantique des esclaves, amenés contre le gré et obligés de travailler sur ces terres. Nous devons pleinement reconnaître que et comprendre comment notre histoire d'inégalité continue à ce jour. Nous devons reconnaître que les Afro-Canadiens ont fait partie intégrante histoire de l'histoire du Canada grâce à leur résilience et que notre histoire ne serait la même sans l'expérience des Noirs. So how can we have a Black History Month? And how can we talk about the reality of there being a Black presence in this country if we don't also acknowledge that they were actually here with Europeans, here um, are not as settlers, but uh, here nevertheless from the earliest times. I also want to just make a point of thanking you and thanking you and merci beaucoup for this opportunity to be honored today. Um, when I left Glendon, I did not ever come back really. And there were some opportunities with the um, Afro Canadian organizations that had started from time to time, but that didn't always continue. I'm deeply honored um, to be given this prestigious acknowledgement. And um, to arrive at this point, I have to credit a number of people. And really, there are way too many people for me to include. But even though some cannot be here to witness this, I, I have to credit my parents, I have to credit my church, my children, and at least one prophet, Glendon. I will start with my parents. Both of them were of African origin. My mother's ancestors arriving as survivors on the Underground Railroad by 1830 or 40, settling in the London, Woodstock, Inner Kip, Woodstock, Brantford area of Ontario. They were strong British Methodist Episcopal Church of Canada supporters, a black church and they were either supporters or administrators in that church. Um, one of my family still lives across the street from a church over generations, helped to build them. My maternal side was guided and inspired, obtained skills and a sense of purpose through the spiritual, but also through the social aspects of the church. Frankly, that was all there was. Even though we didn't have segregation, my mother's family were not necessarily welcomed into all spaces. My mother's mother, my grandmother, migrated to Toronto for better employment opportunities. My father's family was comprised of the descendants of the Black loyalists, the late loyalists, and the refugees of the War of 1812 not from Nova Scotia, but settling in the area of Willow Grove, Elm Hill, Fredericton, and St. John, New Brunswick. My father's mother moved the family um, 
for a time to um, Boston to secure living wages, then returned to New Brunswick on to Toronto where he met my mother. I arrived very late in their married life. No, Mike, sorry. <laughs> By then they had probably given up the prospect of being parents, but um, nevertheless, I managed to arrive and they were exceptional parents, instilling in me through their admonishments and their sacrifices that hard work can lead to awesome achievements. And that purposeful work is done for the common good without expectation of reward. That doesn't mean we don't like money. <laughs> Be cute. Yeah. They sacrificed for me on many, many levels. Uh, I am the first person in my family to attend university. And the promise of hope that this symbolized. I also was shown and provided with generational skills in negotiating being one of very few black people in our neighborhood. My church, the British Methodist Episcopal Church or the Shaw Street Church in Toronto, but there were branches throughout the province, imbued me with an understanding of the dynamism and complexity of the black community. In my weekly encounters with the congregation, I saw the wide range of looks, skills, the reality of a black presence locally and across the province became tangible. And I had further opportunities to hold a provincial leadership position, calling and chairing meetings, making decisions, leading, taking notes. I had a gift for leading other people, making decisions and doing whatever is necessary to finish up group projects. So I'm going to jump ahead to, bit, to when I had children and then come back to Glenda. So I have to refer to my children who were born after Glenda. It was in part due to their experiences in school and in the community that I became more involved in doing Black history or seminal social justice work. The heights that we discussed, the possibilities that we considered while in university did not prepare us in some ways for the reality we experienced once we were out. When my own children came home from school or after particular encounters uh, with the community, or when one of my children wanted to be considered Chinese, since this was the only positive ethnic group discussed at school that was not white, I knew that we were not post-racial and more had to be done. I also, today, want to honor my son. I hope you're watching. Cool. <laughs> My, but I'll honor my three children in their efforts as uh, one of them is a professor, one is a life coach, and one is a student. But my son, hey, it's his birthday today. And um, yes, we will be celebrating later. <laughs> At Glendon College, before marriage and parenthood, I began as an English major but failed to find a connection to the course materials and wondered how I would be able to support myself as the future possible journalist that I thought I might be. So I was not seeing Black journalists in the media that we had at the time, in the States maybe, but not really here. Um, I switched to sociology as a way to find more meaningful content and to gain the understanding of the factors that impacted our society and our lives. It was an opportunity to understand the systemic nature of social forces that Black people often spoke about, 
but we used other terms among ourselves. It was an opportunity to, Glendon was, an, was not without those sacred spaces for black people and black students here that hailed from Canada, Bermuda, Jamaica, Guyana in South America and Cote d'Ivoire often gathered in the common room to provide mutual support and coping skills. This was not just true of Glendon. It was also true at York, Maine. That's what we called it then. <clears throat> not Keel Street Campus, it was York, Maine. <laughs> and, and Black students had their own tables in the cafe, places where they could share issues, consider big ideas, and try to make the curriculum more meaningful to their situations. It is important to remind you that there was no Black history course or programming at any level of education in Canada at the time. And frankly, not so much right now either. So if you wanted to learn about the contributions and achievements of Black people to the development of Canada, you had to talk to older relatives and community members, read what papers and magazines you could source from the African Canadian and African American community, or make a visit to see Lenny and Gwen at Third World Bookstore. And yes, thank you for that. Um, it did not happen otherwise. How was it going to happen otherwise? Even a few years ago, uh, a black man, a historian connected to many Parks Canada projects was denied the opportunity to do graduate study in black history since there was no body of material from which to do so. Even the most prominent white historians continued to spew ideas that managed to overlook the presence of black people, never mind any possible contributions. And then there was Glenda. I was fortunate enough to have been taught by many people, but I keeping it really hyper focused. And here I want to talk about Professor Jean Burnett. And I feel that I just got her. You know, you just get people, you meet them, and you just feel like you just understand them, you understand their energy, something, you just get them. And while she was not bombastic in her delivery, she nevertheless gave amazing lectures. And actually she, she had a binder and she would read and she would turn the page and she would read and she would turn the page and she would read and that, and that until the end of the lesson. Because she was a little bit shy, I think, but she knew her stuff. And she, um, anyway. Um, she was truly available to discuss issues with students. It was an exciting time. Multiculturalism was growing. Oh my God, they were recognizing that there were non-white people in Canada. Woo and we were infusing our lectures and seminars with it. I truly love seminars. I waited my entire life for seminars. Um, I finally could talk in class. Um, I had been the person who had been constantly admonished to be quiet in school. And now I could talk. I could ask questions. I could challenge. I could offer opinions that might actually be considered and further discussed. And I could do this in either official language. I loved it. A lecture might be in French, and the questions might be in English or vice versa. It was incredibly stimulating and engaging and I learned so very much. And I'll just mention at least one other prop, Ronald Savarin. But Professor Burnett was always accessible, offered great feedback and advice and was authentic. Among the truths for the advice or the teaching or the encouragements she provided was the idea that seems you know, like you should know this, but to have her confirm it, that social change is not easy, 
and perseverance is key. And that even if you might have challenges within your own family, which might make you feel like there's certain things you can't do, um, effecting change in other spheres was still possible. That it was preferable to work with organizations that were already doing things that you might want to see done and helping them move the dial rather than attempting to create your own organization. And these were basic tips from the sociologist playbook. And I appreciate them tremendously. I could not have known how much they would be interwoven into my own future. So the celebration of Black History Month has long roots. It began as Negro History Week in the United States, formalized in 1926 through the work of Carter G. Woodson, later expanded to Black History Month in the 1970s. However, in the 1950s, Black history celebrations had been introduced to Canadians, Black Canadians, by the well-traveled sleeping car porters. And one of them, Judge Stanley G. Grizel, was the first to host an event at the British Methodist Episcopal Church, my church, who knew, at 460 Shaw Street, as organized by the women of the Canadian Negro Women's Association, Kaniwa. It was geared to and attended by members of the African Canadian community. And it was under, under the observance of the broader community because it wasn't publicized, it wasn't open to everyone. It was a safe space. It was not until 1978 and the formation of the Ontario Black History Society by, by Dr. Daniel G. Hill, Wilson O. Brooks, Joan Kazmarski, Lorraine Hubbard, Donna Hill, and others, that the first open to all celebration of February as Black History Month took place a year after the OBHS had been formed and after a successful petition to the city of Toronto in 1979. Rella Braithwaite, Paul Anderson, and Karis Newton followed as presidents of the OBHS and annually petition the city of Toronto for the Black History Month proclamation. So within the city of Toronto, Black History Month has been celebrated since 1979. My formal connection to the OBHS did not begin until my third child, yeah, the birthday boy, um, was born. And I found myself an at-home mom. The feminist in me had issues with that. But <laughs> children are important. And they do need their mothers. They need a parent. They need nurturing. And um, we won't get into the costs of daycare and the nature of daycare and the challenges that that presented. Um, so I became president in uh, 1993, and I had daytime flexibility uh, compared to the other board members. So as a modestly funded nonprofit organization, board members were expected to do the work of the organization. And it was a challenge to secure volunteers outside of the board to assist. There was a sense, false as it was, that because there was provincial support for the OBHS, that there were numerous paid staff or that board members were in fact staff. <laughs> I was not paid. My board members were not paid. We were board members. We were board members of a nonprofit. We could not be paid. However, I used my time to help to outreach to people, organizations, church groups, uh, uh, community organizations, everybody. I ended up doing most, if not all, of the Black history presentations in schools. What, when other pres presenters backed out of their commitments. Nobody wants to do that. Anyway, I secured our first mainstream media involvements. Um, 
with CBC Radio and City TV. I secured our first corporate sponsor, TD Bank, and now note how many other Black History Month initiatives they support and other diversity because they've also gone um, to support LGBTQ initiatives. But the OBHS and the brunch was the first support they provided for a non-traditional diverse community organization in the country. As president with my board, most of them former members of Kaniwa, we intensified and sustained efforts to provide educational talks in schools, to create exhibits, to provide Black History bus tours, to provide replies to questions about Black history, to keep our resource center open. Um, and to create the first Black History Month posters, all as a way of raising funds for this organization and to promote annual Black History Month themes. We continue to plan and create the official Black History Month poster, the first having been offered by 1979. And I personally helped to build up the OBHS through the talks that I gave, perhaps as many as two thousand which provided necessary funds for the OBHS for operations in addition to the sum received by the prob from the province. So this is critical because um, at one point in our process very early on in my presidency the province of Ontario cut the funding to our organization which effectively was about 90%. So we already had little money and now we had even less money. And it meant that we were no longer in a position to pay the full-time salary of the one staff person we had in the office. We had no money for an executive director. And um, yeah, it was a challenge. So we created and we kept and built the momentum nevertheless, so that Black history would continue to be sought and studied, to be learned and shared. The annual Black History Month brunch, I grew it from 95 people in a boardroom to 1,000 people at Metro Convention Center. And this is before, <laughs> I, there was a time before social media, when you actually had to phone people or send them an actual letter or a fax. <laughs> oh my gosh. Anyway, um, and I created the OBHS Awards named after important Black Canadian figures that were presented at the brunch. I launched the o OBHS Leaders of Tomorrow program and because TIFF was not including films reflecting African, Black, or Caribbean material, I created BIC, the Black International Film Festival. We did everything possible to build up a community of support, willing to learn more, and a constituent, a, say this, constituency of people with wedded appetites for Black history. Again, soon after I'd become president, following a, an abrupt change of administration, I discovered almost too late that the OBHS had to formally request from the city a proclamation. I thought it just happened, you know, at that point in time. Um, I had not done it. We, I had a new office manager. She didn't know about doing it. So we, um, my son just said, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, my son, uh, my son, forget my son. Happy birthday, <laughs> Um Quickly, this was petitioned for. And while doing so, I requested that this be a permanent annual commemoration. The celebration of February as Black History Month should not have been something so easily, possibly lost. 
further realizing the importance of Black History Month, I was able to obtain a provincial proclamation through our contact person with the ministry, Daniel O'Brien. I then obtained provincial proclamations from each province, although they don't seem to remember that. And then I contacted many members of parliament about the idea by letter. However, it was not until I was at a fundraiser at the home of Denham Jolly being held for Jean Augustine's campaign in the presence of lawyer Lloyd Perry that I initiated again the concept of a national proclamation with Jean Augustine, who was then MP for Etobicoke Lakeshore and parliamentary secretary. She corrected me saying it would be a declaration at the federal level. And after consulting with Lloyd Perry, she agreed. And this was successfully passed in December, 1995 and first celebrated in February, 1996. I was both honored and thrilled to share the platform with the Prime Minister of Canada, Jean Chrétien, and the Black Caucus, like all four of them, in front of a capacity gathering, which included a bus full of supporters from Toronto. Since that time, I have attended every provincial celebration of February's Black History Month, and I have made the pilgrimage to Ottawa to celebrate there as well. Thank you, Air Canada, for canceling my flight so that I was unable to get there last night. For the 20th anniversary of the National Proclamation of February's Black History Month, I was honored with the Honorable Jean Augustine by MP Melanie Jolie and MP Selena Cesar Chavan for our respective roles in creating an official Black History Month in Canada. <sighs> So the reality of a Black History Month required a means to celebrate, to have that pinnacle in the year to honor the ancestors to history, to honor the founders, the legacy, to honor those who had gone before heritage and culture, and to take that time to enjoy and celebrate with each other. Black History Month has continued to inspire and inform our country. Given the nature of these times, it is important to underscore that Black history is seminal anti-racism work. It is also important to note that because Black history is still not required in schools, that um, despite it being proclaimed provincially, and nationally declared that this time, this time period might be the sole time that a student obtains any Black history education or mention. Does that seem appropriate? Yeah. I believe that this event has made it possible, the celebration of Black History Month, for Black history education to take place. Um, that Black History Month affirms people of African origin and that it help also helps others consider the diversity of this vast country. I am proud and honored to have had a role in this significant commemoration. And I continue to advocate for Black history and social justice initiatives. We are part now of the UN Decade for People of African Descent with its goals, themes, of justice, development, and recognition. So I'm um, just as an aside, let me mention that I am also a best-selling author, having written the book called The Kids Book of Black Canadian History. And Black History Month is one of many commemorations I have been successful at securing. Others include August 1st as Emancipation Day at all levels of government didn't get passed nationally until March of 2021, which is quite phenomenal when you consider that I started working on that about 1994. Um, a national day for the Honorable Lincoln Alexander, 
the first black vice regal in Canada. Canada Post stamps, which include Matthew da Costa, the first named African in this country, uh, as well as Willow Grove, the settlement of Willow Grove, uh, another one for black hockey, the colored leagues, and another one for the number two construction battalion, as well as the current one planting the seed for a stamp on Chloe Pouillet. Um, and you can Google that. Um, I also was able to secure historic recognition for a number of people, places, and events, including Kay Livingston, that took 10 years, Harriet Tubman, Marianne Shad, and Richard Pierpoint. Who is Richard Pierpoint? Encore le Franglais. Élevé et embarqué en 1760 dans la crête transatlantique des esclaves, il prend le nom de l'officier britannique à qui il a été vendu. Il sera affranchi pendant la révolution américaine quelques vingt années plus tard pour avoir combattu avec l'armée britannique. Établi dans le haut Canada ou Ontario, il proposera quelques décennies plus tard la mise sur pied du Color Corps qui jouera un rôle clé dans la défense du Canada lors de la guerre de uh, 1812. <laughs> Ses efforts pour revenir en Afrique en janvier. Richard Pierpoint était aussi grand conteur dans la tradition des griots de l'Afrique de l'Ouest, gardien des, des histoires africaines et de la tradition orale. Reconnu par le Canada comme personne d'importance historique nationale et en tant que l'une des premières leaders uh, et militants de la communauté noire africaine, cette plaque, parce que this is the text from a plaque that is in Senegal that I uh, edited, um, cette plaque Henri sa mémoire ainsi que celle de tous les victimes de l'esclavage. En reconnaissance de la contribution des personnes d'ascendance africaine à l'essor du Canada. The story of Richard Pierpoint is, fun, is a fundamental narrative of the experience of a Black loyalist and needs to be included in our commemorations of Canadian history in our discussions about diverse Canadian identities and as further proof of the commitment, skill, and leadership of early Black pioneers, there is a morality here of remembrance that we have. There is a fittingness of this commemoration coming on past the 200th anniversary of um, his clear wish to return home. Il a besoin d'Afrique. Il avait été voulu retourner. This symbolic gesture returns Pierpoint to Senegal and helps to further our duty to remember and underscores our recognition of Pierpoint's last wishes, but also symbolically the need we all have to know our roots, to celebrate our roots, and to be able to go to our ancestral home if we desire. There's one other commem commemorative piece I'm working on currently. And um, January the 20th, I held uh, an event that officially announced the commission of the bust of the Honorable Lincoln Alexander, which will be placed in Queens Park. It recognizes the achievements of the Honorable Lincoln Alexander um, and is to, sorry, to public service. The bust will be part of the educational program and tours at Queen's Park on his legacy as a positive role model for young people, especially black and racialized youth. The proposed unveiling of the bust is slated for January, 2024 to recognize Lincoln Alexander Day. Citing Alexander's life as an example of service, determination and humility. This initiative is an essential step in working toward bringing awareness to the legacy of the Honorable Lincoln Alexander in the years to come. And we are grateful to have you join us on this journey. And 
not that you necessarily want to can make a major donation, but if you do, you can go to www.l2l.ca and look for Lincoln Alexander and make um, a donation. Um, that's my presentation. I tried to time it. That's why I was reading it. I hope you heard some of it because I have a little voice. I'm so sorry. Um, and I'm more than willing to take your questions because I realized there were many quantum leaps that may have been made. So thank you. Um, I knew you'd ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> could you speak more um, about? Uh, she wants me to speak a bit more about Lincoln Alexander. So Lincoln Alexander was born of uh, Caribbean parents in downtown Toronto. He lived on Draper Street, I believe. And Lincoln Alexander uh, went to school in, in Toronto. And by the time he was a teenager, his parents' marriage had broken up. And he was sent to live with relatives in New York, where he was close to getting into a lot of trouble. Um, the war broke out. He returned to Canada and enlisted in the army. And when the war was over, what the army did for people who survived um, is offered them opportunities for uh, further education. He ended up doing that, accepting that. Legal training, uh, you know, a lawyer, and ultimately ended up opening the first, likely the first um, multicultural law practice anywhere in Canada. But he opened it in uh, Hamilton, Ontario, with I believe a Chinese person, a Jewish person, and himself. Um, soon after that, he was invited to become a politician. And his first, and he he will. I'm I, I know him, so I'm trying to speak about him as a person, not as somebody I know. But um, knew he um, he said many times that he really didn't care what party he represented. But when he got to a point where he was willing to run for politics, he ended up joining the Conservative Party, and he in the process of winning the second time he ran, he became, I believe, the first, one of the first black cabinet ministers. Um, number of posts, um, but ultimately what brings him to our attention is the fact that he became the first representative of the queen, um, the first lieutenant governor in the province of Ontario of African origin. And on a personal note, when Link became Lieutenant Governor, he reached out to the Black community and invited them to Queen's Park for a reception. And I was one of the people who went. And um, it was the first time in my life I had ever been to Queen's Park because this was not a space that we found ourselves in. And for me, um, the fact that um, I had the awkward, oh gosh, it's compulsive uh, to check. Um, for me, um, I wonder sometimes if that introduction to Queen's Park made it easier for me than to consider seeing myself in a life of public service, even though I was an elected official. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Sadlia. Could you tell us a little more about the the first uh, black battalion. The number uh, two construction battalion? The construction battalion, that's right. I think that would be quite interesting. Um, not that we're just warmongers, we're not. Um, but I think that one of the reasons that some people are quite interested in people who've served in the military is because there are often records and because one of the stereotypes about African Canadians is that we. Um, are newly arrived. We don't deserve the largesse of, these, of this society, and we haven't done anything to earn it. We haven't even defended this country. So it's very important to talk 
about, to know about those people who have in fact served in those positions. And the, the number two construction battalion was not the first black fighting force in this country, but it was the first, um, it was officially a black battalion that was um, um, pulled together by the Canadian government reluctantly when the war was failing. And it's called the number two construction battalion of Nova Scotia often because they gathered from across the country, not just Nova Scotia, they gathered from across the country and um, internationally to form this unit that became not a fighting unit, but a construction battalion. So they went to Europe, they were building roads, constructing roads. They were doing the labor that made it possible for the ammunitions and the troops to get into the fighting areas. Um, on a personal note, there's um, an image that many of you might see of the number two construction battalion of a band. And the person that you will see on the right is my grandfather. 60% um, of all of the enlistees from New Brunswick or more were related to me. And one from Ontario was related to me through my mother's side. <laughs> um, when they came back, Unlike Lincoln Alexander's experience post World War II, when they came back, they were not necessarily welcomed. They were not included in the usual things that were available to other people that had fought. No benefits for them. And many people stopped talking about their experiences because. It's, it's um, how do you risk your life for your country? Because just because they were doing construction doesn't mean that they weren't facing terrible odds. They went across the Atlantic without even having um, security to defend them in case there were submarines that might be trolling, looking for Canadian ships. I mean, they were at risk just as much as anyone else. They, they, were, they became ill just like anyone else. They worked hard and they came back and they had to find a way to somehow deal with that, um, that they risked their lives and couldn't even have a cup of coffee with somebody, couldn't even go to the Legion Hall. There was no benefit for them. So um, recently, the government of Canada um, did opt to apologize to the descendants of the number two construction battalion. Um, I was going to attend the ceremony in uh, Nova Scotia, but I had broken my ankle and I couldn't travel. So I was, yeah. So I'm still waiting to get whatever was to come of that. If there was some memento, I still have not received that. Um, yeah, first I just wanna say, uh, I appreciate all, like, all that you did to push for the recognition of Black History Month mm -hmm. in Canada. Um, but yeah, just a question uh, regarding uh, just being like blackness in Canada still being shocking uh, today. Uh, how do you think we should approach in making it not shocking? Because I feel like throughout like elementary school and high school, you don't hear about people like uh, Matthew da Costa or Richard Pierpoint. And I'm like a, I'm a sociology major as well. Um, and this is like, this is the first year that I'm hearing about uh, Richard Pierpoint and Matthew da Costa. Um, so how do we make it where people learn this like earlier or where they're not shocked by it when they hear it, um, when they get older? Because you've already been taught a different history for like over 10 years, where when you learn it, it's like, how can this be true? Like, why haven't I known this before? Um. Bad me, chewing gum. Um, it's a great question. 
and, and for, if you couldn't hear the question, it was essentially, um, how do we preserve and promote blackness um, so that, as you put it, it wouldn't be a shock, so that it's regular and usual and routine. And so that when you say, when, well, let me start here. Um, sometimes I am asked a question and the question, um, depending on who it comes from and the, the context, is really a harmless question, it would seem. And I'm going to look at this side of the room as I ask the question for the reaction. Where are you from? <laughs> <laughs> and why? And so this group, this side of the room gets it. And this side might get it, but you didn't react, but I knew I'd get a reaction. So the, the, the problem with the question is a reflection of what you were saying. Um, it, we have a, continue to have an overarching narrative that would suggest that Canada is a white country. And then it reluctantly on occasion, and especially when we're reminded through our First Nations land acknowledgements that are performative rather than meaningful very often, um, that there might be, we, that we are on land that does not belong to us. Um, when people say we're a land of immigrants, we are, but does that, is that really how I am? Am I a colonizer? I didn't colonize anybody. And I think it, it's really complicated because if anything, I share the fate of the first, my ancestors shared the fate of the First Nations. We have to have required Black history education from kindergarten to grade 12. Um, one of the things in being a parent is that I felt, I, I felt, and I still feel very strongly that if you have not exposed your child to something super early, it doesn't matter if you try to expose them to it later. You can't, let's look at swimming. Um, you can't help your child learn to swim if you introduce them to a swimming pool when they're 15. If you've allowed them to already live with and percolate all of their fears and uh, lack of awareness about what it means to be in a swimming pool. It's too late. You can't, you can't um, teach somebody about sex education when they're 25 because it might already be too late. They may already have formed opinions and ideas that are not going to be helpful in them um, actualizing themselves. You can't pretend that race does it matter? You can't pretend that you don't see people who are different than you. My children, I know from my own early memories, you see difference. You see who's wearing yellow and who's wearing red. You know who has a dark complexion and who has a light one. You see difference. If you are not affirming a young person in what they can see and hear for themselves in a safe place that we call school, when is it going to happen? When they go home to their parents who already have not learned about Black history because they didn't learn about it, why would you expect that somehow magically by the time they get to grade 12, if you maybe offer it as an option, that they would want to take it? They've already learned that it's not important. And if they're Black, they're already perhaps having internalized negative ways of viewing themselves so that they would have no interest in taking it by that point in time. If you don't do it early, you don't build up an appetite for people who want to learn more as they go through. So if you offer a Black Studies course at university that is not part of a degree program, but if you 
I have already been offering Black history from kindergarten and all the way through grade 12. So that in grade, you know, by the time people are ready to go to university, they already have the shock values on because they already know that there are what there are black people in Canada, that they have a history in this country, that this country was built on 200 years of enslavement because July 1st, 1867, nobody turned a key to find roads and buildings already there for them. It has to happen early. That's the answer. And, and, and so my excitement on February 16th, 1996, when I was on the podium with the Prime Minister of Canada and Sheila Cox, the honorary black member, and um, Eddie Fry and, and, and anyway, my excitement was that now that we have affirmed that there is a Black History Month, this subtle pressure will then impact the provinces even more. And the provinces who are responsible for education would then, I'm, that hope is still there. But I'm, okay, math was at my major. So 1996 and it's 2023, that's what, how many years? It's like my, I, I, I was hoping that my kids would have black history while they were still in public school. I know it's, I'm 29, I know. Uh, they graduated already. So um, they never got that opportunity. Um, and, and just a quick aside, um, the book I did, the Kids Book of Black Canadian History, was to help to address that gap so that there would be something that people could use for their own learning at home and librarians could pull it out and at least it would be that opportunity. And I really hoped that the publisher would make sure that it was printed en français or C. But at the time, that was not done. So hopefully now when the Black population particularly has now 80% of new uh, arrivals to new African Canadian are um, French as their first language. It's not like before. Um, send us on. Um, in your opinion, what are things that we can help bring that education to? Premier years, because like like you said, it, it's really important that we're starting that young. Um, and is there things that, that we can do um, to I don't know put pressure on or to like yeah? What are what are things we can do? The Minister of Education is MPP Stephen Lecce. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he'd love to hear from you. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Prime Minister of Canada. Um, um, Healthcare is a provincial responsibility, but there are ways that the federal government can help to encourage things to happen provincially. Um, you have a city, you have city councillors, uh, wherever you're from. Who's from Toronto? Okay. And who's from small town Ontario someplace? Where are you from? Where? Newmarket, South Bay Bay. <laughs> they have a human rights room at the uh, York Region Police Station. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but there, there are some progressive counselors. Um, I think that it's, it's re and, and also I think that it's a, about um, this institution as well. Um, I understand that this is a course that's looking at Black history a little bit. You're talking about Montreal. You're talking about Little Burgundy. You're talking about Rockheads. Not talking about Rockheads yet, you will. Um, and so, I mean, asking, requesting more courses like this. Is this a sociology course? History. History. Well, um, but I mean, requesting more of those kinds of programs and, and taking them if they're, um, if they're full credit courses, of course. Um, but, and also the, um, 
faculties of education because I also did a teaching degree. <laughs> and um, I, I'm laughing because, okay. I did a teaching degree and I did a teaching degree uh, a few years ago and um, it was great, it was exciting, it was wonderful. Um, but there was no black history. There was no, not too much talk of diversity. So, you know, lots of how to mark, like me, the overarching things you need to know as a teacher. But what was not there was the diversity, the multiculturalism, whatever the catchphrase might be. So towards the end of the school year, we had the opportunity to, to do presentations. And I was going to do one on black history. And the, the time kept being changed and kept being changed and kept being changed until it was literally the last day of school that I was going to be bringing black history to my class to teach a class of white people who were going to go on to teach of diverse, diverse classes throughout the city of Toronto and beyond. And the time I was given was reduced from one hour to half an hour, and then from half an hour to about 15 minutes. And it was already the last day of school. It already was not going to count for a grade. It already meant that, and I remember holding up, we had videos, that's how long ago it was, holding up a video that I was had intended to show. And I said, I'm showing you a video on Black history. So we have to look at faculties of education. And of course, things have improved in certain areas for some faculties better than others. But it, it, it requires everything. Um, black history isn't just about do it in history. Black history is about do it in life. Black history is about making sure that representation is happening, that reflection is happening, that some reference, some possibility to open up the dialogue so that the same old references are not always the ones that we have to use. The same old ideas are not always the ones we have to share. Yes. Well, first of all, I'm sure everybody will agree that uh, for someone without a mic, you, you heard me. You, you have, and you are a powerful voice. Um, I just wanted to point out that the question was posed, and I can't help but notice that this is uh, Bo. And for those who don't know, Bo, he was the first black president of the Lennon campus. Uh, Glenn College Student Union. So that's a great question for you. Um, commemoration is public art. And public art reflects how we see ourselves, what we value at a point in time. And at this point in time, I would like to think that we value and see ourselves as a diverse country a diverse place where we should be reflecting diversity. Um, when I talk about Lincoln Alexander, um, I come at this from a nonpartisan position. Um, I have no political anything in, in the works here. It, it, I look at it in terms of him being the first black vice regal, one of the highest appointments anyone can have in this country. Is he a perfect person? No, um, but who was? So I think that it's, a, it's almost more a reflection of us and what we see as important and what we value. And um, I think that we should be looking at more commemorations um, because I think that that's a way to, you don't know what thing is going to spark somebody on their particular learning curve because as much as we love Glendon, I love Glendon, I got my first degree here, um, but all learning doesn't take place in the classroom. All, all learning, as much as I loved seminars, I still do, 
um, they're so vibrant. Um, all learning doesn't take place there. You can be walking along and see that image, see that statue, see that, and it makes you think, even for a minute. Maybe you'll go and Google them, Google more about them, Google something about the context, and in that way you come to know more. So it's not perfect, but we're working at making what's imperfect better. One more. <clears throat> you mentioned uh, the title of one of your books just now. Which which one was it? Uh, I my my bestseller <laughs> is the kids' book of Black Canadian history, but I've written seven. That's <clears throat> okay. So my recommendation. I'm not getting a commission on this, but I'm <laughs> using that one right now because I'm helping to teach educate my grandson who is seven years old. And I have him reading from that one. So I would say to you, if you want your children, nieces, nephews, even you yourselves, it's an easy read, but a very informative, a very important read. Uh, Marianne Shad, Richard Tierpoint, all those uh, historical Canadians are mentioned in it. So. Uh, yeah, you can Google me and, and see what I've written. And um, you can get certainly get those books and they're available in the library. Yeah. Uh, another book that might be a, a bit higher level is called Black History, Africa, the Caribbean and the Americas. And it was originally published by uh, Elon Montgomery Publications, but now it's published by the Delmore Buddy Day Learning Center. That's been updated a bit. There's a teacher's guide with that. That's why I mentioned that one. So if you're teaching, I talked a long time. Merci, Rosemary. Thank you for walking us through your journey full of your activism. You are really a source of inspiration for us, for our students, and the beauty of it is that you are like an alumni. And I usually think the way of summarizing a complex idea in one word is not simple, but I can try. Maybe. In French, I would say determination, resistance, and through resistance come accomplishments. And also one thing I want to share, you share with us about the beauty of being Glendonia. Should we say Glendonia? <laughs> being bilingual. Okay. <laughs> So one of the beauty of being part of this Glendon family so that you can learn in both languages. And also I am a sociologist. I was so proud that sociology can help us and teach us the roots of injustice, of inequality. So not doing publicity of hatred. <laughs> So I would like to recognize and to thank the prophet, our principal, Dr. Marco Fiona, who has supported us to organize this event, and also to recognize our associate, principal of Affaires Académiques, mm -hmm. Professor Swan, for being here. Thank you very much. And with that, I would like also to introduce Professor Dr. Fiona. Merci. Merci. Merci beaucoup. I will not be long. I'll be in between your sandwich and the street. So I'll, I'll try to be as quick as I can. Uh, Madame Salir, Madame Lazarie, please 
de l'Institut Harriet Tubman, mes chers collègues, mes chères étudiantes et chers étudiants. C'est avec beaucoup d'émotion aujourd'hui que je me joins à vous pour honorer et pour témoigner notre estime à euh, une de nos diplômées, Madame Rosemary Sandler. It's no secret, I think, that Glendonians are immensely proud of themselves <laughs> and proud of their uh, alma mater and uh, of the alumni community to which they belong. They're very quick to claim as theirs any peer or anyone who's from Glendon and who goes on to distinguish themselves. I would say that all of our alumni distinguish themselves, but some a little bit more than others. And today we're honoring one of ours, one whose achievements are nothing short of extraordinary. Rosemary Sadler is one of those Glendon grads who inspire our students, who gives our professors and staff reasons, in, uh, reasons to believe in our mission to create positive change in the world. Whether your world is your immediate community, your city, your nation, or an the international scene. The presence of Rosemary Sally on our campus today is no accident. Not so long ago, we were honored to feature her in the convocation video, uh, a video that you can find on our website. But we wanted to, and we needed to do a little bit more, a little bit more uh, so that today we're letting you in on a little bit of a secret. You're getting a scoop today without, um, you didn't really know that this was coming. <laughs> so later this month, we will be revealing a large commemorative wall, a wall of recognition, a, a, a mur de la reconnaissance, a wall of fame, our wall of fame, a mur de distinction. It will be installed prominently in the center of excellence on the main floor, just below where we are right now. The wall will feature photos and narratives of leaders from, a very, from various walks of life who all share a connection with Glendon. The dedication of this new installation will coincide with the launch of a new webpage where we will provide information about those celebrated personalities and of those whose con con contribution, I can say that, we need to honor more proudly. Together, those stories will be a living monument. Interestingly, we've been talking about monuments, so it will be a living monument that will tell the impact that Glendon can have in the world. So what we're sharing with you today is a small glimpse, a bit of a mock-up that Pascal called it, a mock-up of what the wall will look like. Um, you'll notice the idea. We, we've been, I'm looking out there and I see trees. There will be trees inside as well. Um, you get an idea of what the wall will look like. You'll notice a tree with text, first acknowledging the land and First Nations contributions, of course, as well as an invitation to appreciate this unique place that is Glendon and its people. It's a stylized illustration of how Glendon is a place where people grow strong place that nourishes us and a place that encourages us to go further, to aim higher. So I'm happy today to announce that the very first person we will honor on this wall is none other than our speakers, Rosemary Sandier. C'est une idée, je dois le dire, c'est une idée qui a vu le jour dans la tête de nos collègues du CEREC, le Caucus d'équité raciale et qui a, no pun intended, it grew. <laughs> the seed was planted and it grew, and it'll be something that, um, will be, uh, that we will all be very proud of. Um, congratulations again. We're very, we're very proud of you. We thank you for your life, for your dedication, for your teachings today, um, for your will and your determination to make this world a better place a fairer place, a more equitable place. On behalf of all Glendonians, I wish to express our collective gratitude. Thank you. Merci beaucoup.
Just coming up here. Nobody told me to. <laughs> but I uh, let me just say my best line in French. Je suis vraiment fier. <laughs> Um, and thank you very, very much. Um, I like it. <laughs> so I hope um, you guys are leaving us now, right? And I can do, you can get a picture. I'd love that. Absolutely. So I can give it to my son. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. There you go. 